And just a couple announcements. One, we are live streaming this meeting. And so we're also recording it so that we can put it up on our website. So just sort of keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you start to fall asleep or do something, it's going to be videotaped. And then secondly, we, we have a really packed agenda today. We're really excited. Can I ask how many of you, while everyone's getting settled, how many of you, this is your first time to a parent leadership team meeting? Oh, All right. Oh my gosh, that's exciting. That's fantastic. Good job. Yeah. That's fantastic. We, um, let me explain a little bit about the purpose of the parent leadership team. We, the reason why we're here is we want to be able to give you information. And it's, it's usually very pertinent information. We try and give you information that might be powerful for you as a parent, but also as a leader at your school. So our expectation is for you to go back to your school and share this information. If you just hold on to it yourselves, then we're just not going to carry things forward like we really need to. So what you learned today, we really want you to take back to your school and talk to your administration about ways that you can share the information. Maybe it's in a meeting. Maybe uh, we're, our restrooms are... And my name is Ginny Gleason. I should introduce myself. And I work uh, with Title I, Family Engagement, and I also work and support all our elementary school counselors. So I have great opportunities here at Brevard. And this is Javon Blum, and she also puts these meetings on. We do this together, and she works in the Title I office as well. So we'd like to start all our meetings with the pledge. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. So the snacks that you just had are provided by a sponsor. And we are very lucky to have Mr. Leatherman, who is here, and he has decided to sponsor all of our meetings this year. So, yes. And his company is Primerica. And so we always like to give him just a couple minutes to say hello, because without his sponsorship, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to have the food, and we really think it's important to share some food with you when you come. Okay. All right. Good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning. I first want to give it up to the great uh, Jenny and Javon. Uh, I really believe that this is more of a labor of love than um, anything else. That you all don't know how fortunate you are that our kids have somebody that connects you to our kids and us and somebody together to the school board. They are really off the charts, incredibly double, triple awesome. So you should give them a quick, uh, quick round of applause. So um, my wife and I are committed to, to them and to you guys for the whole year uh, because I believe in, in what they do. Uh, I know what it's like to, um, to be on free lunches. I grew up on free lunches. My parents were divorced. And uh, I was getting so emotional about that crap. Uh, I also cry a lot, so we're going to cry this year for sure. So, <laughs> menopause. You ladies had men men menopause. It's terrible. It's so terrible. Um, so I know what that's like. I know what it's like to go to a pawn shop with your dead father's guns to try to turn on your light bill. I know what it's like to go to your grandmother because you can't pay your mortgage for four months in a row and city banks bang on your door. And I know what it's like to be free. I choose freedom all day, every day. And so it occurred to me that uh, since we're gonna be together this year, that we should not come from the space of my agenda, we should come from the space of your agenda. Because I never ever wanna be the guy at the front with all the free pens hoping to sell you something. That's just a bunch of crap. And I don't think you all want that either. So I thought it would be great uh, since we're gonna be, how many sessions do we have together? Four, three? Uh, we have uh, four more. Four more. Four more.
four, uh, so good news, we have four more, bad, bad news, we have four more. Um, <clears throat> so I have the, you know, I, I'm a financial coach, I make sure that you're not working at Publix at age 80. Uh, so I have the ability to talk about just about anything uh, that you would like to learn about when it comes to money. They don't give me uh, tons of time here because it's about you, not about me. But I wanted to hear maybe from you all um, about some things that we could touch on uh, at each session. So this is the audience participation um, part. I brought my notepad. So if you all shout out maybe a couple of things that you would love to learn about, then we could make it about you, not about me. Amen? Okay, so somebody shout one out. And I'm just going to step in right now. Since we are filming, if you're not on the mic, we're not hearing you. So I'm going to try and give you the mic. Or you could... The dreaded microphone. That means you'd have to publicly speak. Saving for college. Okay, so we want to talk about college savings. For multiple children. And, and how about if I don't really support my kids going to school and maybe they want to do something different? My, my, my son came to me and goes, Dad, oh, I can't even record it. Let's just say my son didn't want to go to college for all the obvious reasons. Uh, because he's a lot like me, but he ha but he did go and get a captain's license. He's 26 years old and makes 80,000 a year from captain's license. Yeah, pretty cool. So when you talk about that, okay. Anything else? Come on, yes, ma'am. Getting more parents involved, or are we talking about money? We're talking about money stuff. But uh, why don't we have a conversation about how to get uh, your kids involved about money? Yes? Yeah, so that way we don't enable them. Okay, so kids and money. We have two more topics we can hit. Yes, ma'am. I'll wrap that into the whole thing. I'll, I'll wrap that into what do I do about college. Yes, ma'am. We're volunteering for our children through your company for finance. So they can learn finance. Well, we could. And I have some books with me actually called um, How Money Works for Kids. Okay. Okay, we have one more. One more. Uh, I'll give you all a hint. It starts with D. Yes. Ends with a T. Yeah, that's not what yeah. I was going to say. But not death. Yeah, no. Retirement is how much you need. I've heard several different amounts, and they're hugely different. Yep. I call that a thin number. Thin number. So we're talking about thin numbers, and somewhere I'm going to put debt. Debt in, in, in this, in our time together. Don't you think we're going to talk about debt? I know you guys are debt free and financially independent, so we'll just waste 30 or 40 minutes on debt, right? Yeah, by the way, did you know there's six different ways to calculate interest? What does that mean? We, this table here, we could all have a visa at 12%. But we would pay different amount of, of money and time to get out of that. The number is the same on your statement, but how they're calculating it is completely different. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, I'll give you a hint. There's a reason why to give you cash back. Anyway, so uh, give it up for Jenny and Javon. I'm super pumped to be here for the rest of the year. These guys are the best of the best. Who's taking over from here? All right, bring us on, girlfriend. Thank you so much, and thank you for your amazing sponsorship. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. We really do. And we're going to hear from someone very special that you may not... Oh, no problem. Well, that was exciting. Lorraine Durkis, if you would come up here for just a minute. And I think a lot of you may already know some of the great work she does, but we'd like you to, to meet the woman behind E Angels. Good morning. You may not know me. Your kids may not know me. I guarantee your teachers know about me. Uh, we help kids. We're a nonprofit, and we help with uh, things that kids may not be able to afford, like field trips. Uh, glasses, all kinds of strange little one-offs that there aren't any other funding sources for. Um, I started out just like you guys. Uh, my kids were at Sea Park Elementary a long time ago, and oh, I was like you, PTO, room mom, the whole enchilada. And one day, one of the teachers walked up to me and said, do you think the PTO could buy 
dictionaries for my class. I'm like, mm, the whole class, no, they don't have that kind of money. He said, because I know there's a couple of kids that just can't afford it. So I said, well, a couple of kids, now let me see what we can do. So I started talking to teachers, and I was hearing from teachers the stories about kids that couldn't afford to go on field trips, uh, you know, didn't have school supplies, didn't have shoes, their feet were scrunching out of the shoes. On the other hand, I'm talking to parents, and they're saying, yeah, if you need a couple extra bucks, just let me know, I'll send it in with my kid. So we had these two sides, we just needed to connect them. So I came up with the idea called eAngels, based on email. So we just collected people's email addresses, and when we had a need, we would send out something generic like, uh, we need $11 for a kindergartner's field trip to the zoo. They would make a tax-deductible donation to the PTO. We would pay for the kids' field trip. Everything was great. So we did it there for several years. Then we moved on down to Sebastian, and Sunrise Elementary School was opening, and Mr. Pitcher there had said, would you do E-Angels here? So I did it there for about eight years, and then I started thinking, you know, it's such a simple process, and we're helping so many kids, why don't we grow it? So about six years ago, we founded uh, a nonprofit, 501c3, and we help, we probably do 95% of our work in Brevard County. Uh, but since we're such a virtual organization, we can help kids anywhere. We can get donations from everywhere. We help kids in Texas, California, Maine, all over the place where word gets out about e-angels. And we have supporters all over the country. We've even gotten a donation from someone one time in London that heard about us. So if you're on Facebook, please look up e-angels and friend us. Also, I'm going to go around and hand out or some uh, cards. We're having a fundraiser next month uh, at Coco High School. It's David Da Vinci Thrillusionist. He is absolutely amazing. And uh, I'll be at the next meeting and I'll bring tickets to it as well. Tickets are just $20. It's a family friendly show, family friendly prices. You will love it. Your kids will love it. And uh, we just want to get a word out about it because this is how we're able to pay for all the strange little things that we do to help kids. And I really appreciate your support. If uh, you want to send me an email, I'd love it. Get in touch with your, I'd like to get in touch with your parent group because we need support. Um, my email address is help at e-angels.org. And um, our website is e-angels.org, but it's under construction right now as we're switching providers. But please email me, I will pass these out. And also, as far as they'll go, I've got E-Angels wristbands. One of the things that we did was um, after the shooting in Parkland, we had a series of community forums to find out what we could do specially uh, because of our unique positioning to support the schools and support what they do. So we came up with three things that we decided upon. The first thing was uh, transportation. A lot of times parents can't come to the schools for IEP meetings, teacher conferences, things like that. Um, so we actually uh, have, a have an Uber account. So if teachers contact us that they need transportation, we can set that up. We also have, um, we have volunteer scholarships. We are paying for some parents to get certified to be volunteers in the schools and they commit to a certain number of volunteer hours. And also we had a E-Angels Club for elementary students, which we did at the entire school of Roosevelt last year and it was a tremendous success. So I appreciate your help, your support, Please email me, and uh, we appreciate everything you do for the kids. Thank you. Yes. Can we just have the email one more time? 
certainly help at e-angels.org. Thank you. Thank you. All right, what an amazing organization. Uh, I personally receive the emails, and every single time I see one, I get a smile on my face thinking, oh, man, I could do something. I didn't know there was a need. So uh, it is definitely a feel-good organization. We're so excited to have you all here today. We have so many new faces. Um, it's incredible to be empowering you with information that you're taking back to your schools, you're taking back to your community groups, you're sharing with those parents in the car loop. Um, we are really about empowering you with information. So not just about what's going on with the district, but things to think about with your own children. And we always want you to keep in mind that it might not be relevant now in your current stage of parenting or you know, uh, volunteering, but it might later become relevant. It might later be something that you can share with someone who's going through that situation. Hence why we give you those handouts and we encourage you to share them at your school and in your community and keep them together in the binder so you can go back and refer to them. One of our biggest outlets of being able to capture the parent voice in Brevard Public Schools is through our parent survey. And we do it every spring. And this past spring, we had 50, over 15,000 responses, which is un incredible. And thank you all that have done it. But we need more. We need every parent in Brevard to be completing this, because every parent in Brevard has a voice. And we need that voice that, that drives our programs that lets us know the things that we're not aware of that are easy fixes. It also lets us know what communication that we need to put out to our families so they understand the, the whys and the hows uh, that we do things up here. So you'll see that our elementary parents rock the survey every single year, 9,000, which is fantastic. And then something happens. They get to middle school and we have under 2,000 parents. So remember, just a couple years ago, those elementary parents were completing it. They get to the black hole of seventh and eighth grade, and they forget about our parents' survey. And I don't know about you, I'm, I have a seventh grade daughter, and there is a lot of stuff I do not know about middle school. And I see things that I'm concerned about. And some of us are not comfortable um, making that conversation with administration. This is your outlet. Please know that they are being read. I can say in years past, you know, it's like something that we did, we checked a box, it was compliance, but we have directors, we have our CFO, we have our superintendent that are all, always requesting information from that survey. So they really are using that to improve our pro programs here. And then something happens, the middle school parents turn into high school parents and they come back, they rally. Um, but what we do see, even though we have more elementary participants, we still see trends. So we've pulled out a few of the, the questions from those surveys just to show you. We're always talking about communication, right? That's one of the biggest things that we hear. We get the highs and the lows. We, our schools are doing fantastic with communicating. Our schools are doing terrible. So we ask the question, OK, how do you prefer to be communicated? And email is still number one. But we know that we've got a young younger group of parents coming up, and they're very tech savvy. So you can see that texting is uh, following up very quickly. And I think our schools are trying to get there as well. It's something new for them. It's a little bit scary. But um, we're definitely making great strides. We do have pockets of awesomeness. Then we asked another question. The, Jenny and I love this one. How often do your child's teachers, not you, the teachers communicate with you about your child's progress? So you'll see elementary, we got a lot of dailies and weeklies, and then we get to middle and high school. Check out those nevers. That hurts my heart, because there is no more important time for you to stay on top of your child than in middle and high school. I mean, there's just way too many opportunities being missed. So this is information we're sharing with our schools. They're coming up with improved communication plans, but remember this, if they're not reaching out to you, you reach out to them relentlessly. The emails, if they don't respond to the emails, call the front office, send a note in the planner, do what you need to do. So when we find out that there are areas of improvement with certain people, we can get on that. But don't give up. Just because, and I read, we read the comments and we'll say, people will say, I've emailed eight times and I've never heard back, so I gave up. Don't give up. Email eight more times. Keep going. 
Questions? Can you come up to the microphone? They won't hear it. I'm sorry. It's his chance to shine. Jenny, you, or you can meet him with the microphone. Actually, just a, a simple question. I, I mm -hmm. feel who actually thinks of the questions themselves that are on the survey. I remember taking the survey last year, and I thought to myself, "Well, would I like to ask this or this or this?" And I was just curious. Well, it's a it's a group of people, and we um, we try to craft the questions to get the information that we need. Do you know what I mean? Like we are very thoughtful about the questions we put on there because we don't want you to think that it's just a hoop you jump through, like the grade level, the school that you go to. We're really trying to dig down and identify areas of focus, areas of improvement, areas that are challenges, or you know we're, we're, what we're doing well. So the answer is it's a few of us, um, but we are always welcome to feedback. You can talk to one of us afterwards. You can send us a little note. Okay. What's the rule in the mic? So if I would like or would want a question to be on the survey, emailing Jenny would be a step towards that? Sure. And then we would bring it back to those that uh, consider the questions and see if it's something that they would consider adding. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, Steve wants to ask a question. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a question, but um, when I was taking the survey, mm -hmm. I have two kids, one in middle school and one in high school. Yes. Um, it seems like some of the questions are overlapping each other. Okay. So perhaps you can kind of look at the survey going forward and see if you can probably combine some of the questions into the other. Because um, I'm on the staff committee at Rockledge High. Um, I'm hearing that it's too long. So, right. just the, just the we great struggle, feedback. Yeah, great feedback. We struggle with that every year. And then if you, if how do you pick 10 questions when we're really trying to capture an entire school and an entire family's needs? And everybody has different children. And everybody's situation is very different. So if we leave off a few that might not be uh, super relevant to you or super important to you right now, it is to someone else. That's fantastic feedback. We are constantly evaluating those questions. I think you have a couple more questions. Could you come to the mic? Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people that are Facebook, right? Correct. So could you do random Facebook polls? And that way you have you ask a certain question and then you have the poll and you'll probably get 10,000 answers on the poll. We could. And you do it sporadic throughout the school year. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a possibility. We could talk to the, de the department that does that. Thank you. Um, my thought was similar to hers that I thought maybe do it twice a year mm -hmm. instead of having one long one at the end. To make, I know some of the questions you want to ask have to do with the whole year, so save those for the end. Correct. But the other ones do mid-year maybe. Okay. Definitely, that's a possibility to look into. Thank you for the feedback. All right, so just know that on our uh, family engagement webpage on the district, from the district's website, you can see uh, the, the uh, hello, what am I talking about? The parent survey results from all of our schools. So each school is there, their results. If you haven't seen it at your school, even though we encourage all administrators to address them, and you can also see district-wide, so you can look at across the district, what did elementary families say, what did middle school families say, and what did high school families say. So there's a lot of uh, great information out there at your fingertips. Hey, Joanna, I, I remember this from last year. I, I'm uh, not proud to tell you that I was a never. Oh, man. So one of my tips that I took from last year, which was spectacular, I set, a, for those dads of us that are nevers, I set a timer from this, we last year, I set a timer in my phone. So now, every Wednesday, uh, I check in with Jack and and uh, about his grades and whatever, and, and because he knows that Daddy is actually checking in, it's a whole other conversation. It's pretty <laughs> cool, thanks to that. So that's how you can not be a never. But I took that from you all last year. Fantastic, that's great, great suggestion. All right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. So I am so honored to be able to introduce Dr. Dalani, 
Um, he is this, the chief of pediatric cardiology at Nemours Hospital. And I know many of you have heard about the um, electrocardiograms that we are now doing um, for all of our student athletes. So we just want to kind of talk to you a little bit about that and keep you informed. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here. And I hope in 30 minutes I can uh, teach you how to read an EKG and uh, what your, uh, you know, and um, learn about how your kids' results uh, would, could impact uh, them over time uh, with this. So. Uh, I do, I am on the American Heart uh, Board and uh, I do read EKGs for who we play for um, at, on a voluntary basis with us. So um, I just wanted to disclose those and objectives today. Usually medical students learn EKGs over about a two week period. Uh, so I've taught both uh, in Tampa and here in Orlando. And um, we're gonna do it all in 30 minutes or less. So we're gonna ask for some volunteers here to read some EKGs that have been done in your school district. Uh, here, but we want to make sure everyone leaves uh, knowing what the most common causes of sudden cardiac arrest are in student athletes and um, different forms of cardiovascular disease that can be picked up on screening EKGs uh, with that. So, why should we care about cardiovascular disease? How many of us in the room either have some form of cardiovascular disease ourselves or have a family member? So, we just got more than two-thirds of the room here, okay? We should care about cardiovascular disease in ourselves, not only our kids, but in ourselves, because one out of three of us is gonna pass away from some form of cardiovascular disease over our lifetime. Be that a heart attack, be that a stroke, um, be that a blood clot. Um, so if you just look in your own family uh, and family members that have passed, many of them probably passed from a cardiovascular cause. Our goal as medical providers is to try to reduce that number over time. And it takes a whole community in order to do that. So um, screening in, in schools uh, for cardiovascular disease is one form of uh, lowering that risk over a lifetime. But it's estimated that more than 70 million Americans have some form of cardiovascular disease with that. And we wanna catch as much as possible that's in uh, Brevard uh, schools. So from a high school standpoint, there's over 7 million high school athletes on an annual basis in the United States. That's a lot of students when you look at that, okay? And uh, there's over 400,000 college athletes with that. Our most common form of cardiovascular disease in young athletes will be a high blood pressure. But hormonal changes that occur during puberty can also precipitate uh, risks with intense training. Uh, so that uh, student athletes uh, may be in a higher risk category than, than uh, some other kids that aren't athletes. So when we look at all causes of sudden cardiac death, there's not a national registry in the United States. So this is a retrospective review of uh, patients who have passed that Dr. Marin does out of uh, Minnesota. And uh, they look at patients uh, throughout the United States that pass away um, as a student athlete with that. And, if you were to draw a line down here, half of this pie chart is this thing called HDM, called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where you develop an abnormal thickening in the heart. Over 95% of the time, you can pick that up on an EKG. There are some things you cannot pick up on an EKG. The next box called coronary abnormalities. If you're born with an abnormal coronary artery, you can't pick up. And uh, many of the rhythm issues here, you can pick up uh, with that. So EKGs are very good at pick, identifying uh, some causes of sudden cardiac death, but not all with that. When we look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they have a list of all the causes of sudden cardiac death here for you. Again, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is listed up here at number one um, with that. All the other ones are, are uh, broken down for you. Now, Again, there's no national uh, database of high school students, but we, there is a national database of every NCAA student in the United States. So if we took all NCAA students that pass away from any form of death, um, accidents are gonna be number one. So again, you have college students here, so mo uh, motor vehicle accidents, uh, motorcycle accidents, you know, people doing crazy stuff at frat parties, sorority parties, other things, right? So you have accidental deaths that occur with that. From the medical deaths that occur, 
Uh, many of them occur with exertion, so their symptoms come on when they're exercising up at peak exercise with that more than 75% of the time. Sorry, this one's a little dark, but our most common causes of, and this is from the uh, American Heart Association, but the most common causes of um, sudden cardiac arrest during sports, uh, the highest risk sport is basketball, swimming, lacrosse, football, all in that order. So basketball is number one, okay? Just so that everyone's aware. Again, these are NCAA athletes, okay? Uh, with that. Now, the American Heart Association recommends for all student athletes getting a 14-element uh, checklist done. So when you go to your pediatrician uh, to get your school physical done, you know they will ask certain questions in the personal history, in a family history, and then also do a physical exam uh, for that. So uh, every student uh, prior to sports participation should make sure they get um, all three of those things uh, done to be able to detect who's at higher risk um, than others. Sorry, our clicker's a little slower. Um, all students also get a pre-participation sports physical uh, form filled out. Please, 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 if I can give you one recommendation to take home. Don't just look at this form and check note everything. Please read the questions, okay? If you have a family history of someone with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that we just talked about, there's a 50% chance the next generation also have that. 50, okay? That needs to be checked off on that list. If someone's died in the family or has any type of significant heart disease, please make sure it's there. Many times when students come in for their you know, pre-participation uh, sports physical, again, the family fills this part out. The medical providers aren't filling this out. But all we see is a line run straight down. And we know they did it two seconds before they walked into the room and are just standing it there. And probably never even read any of those questions with it. Okay? But that's a great way to flag who may be at higher risk uh, than the other students sitting next to them. Okay? But make sure that's really read and filled out appropriately. And don't let your kids fill it out, please. Okay? Because they probably didn't know what a second cousin passed away from, you know, on one side of the family versus the other. With that. Wow. See if we can get this. There we go. So uh, back to the NCAA. Again, when you do EKG screening in the NCAA, so Division One schools have done an, uh, EKG screening, what do we expect? So uh, Brevard just rolled this out last year. What do we expect for our student athletes um, based on, on this? With it. So if you took 5,000 uh, Division One students here that underwent EKG screening, what you're going to find is your abnormal rate is going to be less than 5% okay, for a screening process. And less than 1% will have critical heart disease, meaning they have a form of heart disease that's going to put them at potential risk for sudden cardiac arrest with that. So now let's do some EKGs, okay? And I need some volunteers for this, because I want to teach you how to read EKGs really, really quick. And we're going to take some volunteers, but first we need a model. So we're going to call uh, Aaron up. So Aaron, Aaron works for who we play for and does many of the screen, screening here in Brevard County. So uh, we're going to put Aaron here. So we can our, uh, model today. And I'm bad at drawing heart, but I pulled the district before. So let's just say this is Aaron, Aaron's heart. Okay, so he has his heart here. And who wants to be our volunteer to read a normal EKG? You know, come on. We'll give you a mic. Uh, okay. 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 I'm sorry, your name is? Patricia. Patricia. So we thank Patricia for being one of our volunteers here. And we're going to prove that in 10 minutes you can learn how to read EKG here, okay? And then I'm going to show you examples of EKGs that were all found right here in Brevard County. Okay, so number one. Oh. Well, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what happened. Can you take us back one? Yeah. This clicker's not working. I'm not sure why not. Okay, there it is. Okay. Okay. 
So number one is your child's going to come home with an EKG. Okay? It's going to say normal or abnormal on it. If it's normal, right, most of the time, again, 95% of the time, that child has no cardiac disease. But we know there are some forms of cardiovascular disease that won't be picked up by an EKG. So just remember that. Okay? Even if your child has a normal EKG, a small percentage can still have an underlying heart issue. Okay? It does not pick up 100%. If it's abnormal, okay, you're going to have, again, the critical ones being those that have heart disease that can cause sudden cardiac arrest be about 1% out of this. But you're going to have, again, 4% be abnormal but not cause critical heart disease with that. Okay? So that, that's what we expect when we do the screenings. And, um, that's what, uh, so far, the first uh, year of this has uh, yielded here with us. So now let's look. Patricia's going to help us read this EK, uh, Aaron's EKG here uh, with that. So the one way that I always like to explain the heart to families, okay, when I meet them, is just to think of the heart as a box. So how many people took high school biology? Okay. We probably all repress the anatomy of the heart here, okay, if you haven't used it in the last 20 years, Okay. But let's go through it really quick here. But we have four chambers. We have a right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Okay, our right side takes unoxygenated blood and pumps it out to the lungs. That blood flow gets oxygenated, and then it gets returned back to the left side with oxygen. And the left atrium, left ventricle, take that blood and squeeze it out our aorta to supply our whole body then with oxygenated blood. Because we have essentially two pumps here in the heart, we have to make sure those two pumps beat at the same time. You cannot have one side squeezing and the other side just sitting there. They're sharing a wall together. So in order to coordinate the squeeze of it, there's an electrical system in the heart. And that's what our EKGs are picking up for us. So there's an area on the, on the right side called our sinus node that acts as our pacemaker. So it's firing out this electrical energy. That electrical energy travels around on little nerve fibers or wires that run through the atrium and come to the AV node which sits in the center there. The AV node's job is to slow that electrical energy down because these upper chambers need time to allow this electrical energy to go down. And that electrical energy rushes real quickly down the lower chambers, and then it spreads out across our heart muscle on both the right side and on the left side. So electrical energy goes from point A to point B all the way down to point C. That's all an EKG is picking up for you. Okay, so Patricia's going to look at this EKG here and give us our results here. Okay? So let's just say this is Aaron's EKG. Right? So we have this first wave, and in medicine it'd be really nice if we named it A, B, and C, but nothing's that simple. Okay? <laughs> so for Patricia, our first wave would be electrical energy going where? If it started here. Yeah, so this is going to be our upper chambers here. So this first wave we get is our upper chambers getting electrically excited. Okay? Then electrical energy came to the center of the heart. So this is going to be our AV node, center of the heart. Then we get this huge big spike called our QRS, which is electrical energy rushing down the lower chambers. And lastly, we get this wave called our T wave, which is electrical energy clearing all of our heart cells out here. Your T wave tells you the health of your heart muscle. If you flip a T wave, you got a heart muscle problem. Okay? So we're going to go look at some of these EKGs. Okay, so now this is Aaron's EK, let's say this is Aaron's EKG here, Patricia. So we're gonna read here, and I know this is small if you're sitting in the back of the room, but you got P, Q, R, S, T, okay? P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, and it goes all the way across, P, Q, R, S, T. Okay, so now let's say Patricia's standing right here on Aaron, okay, because we put those little leads all across our chest. If I put a lead here on Aaron, Okay, and my electrical energy is all going this way, away from the, us. Any electrical energy going away from us is all going to be negative. Okay, it's all going to go down. So V1 here sits right here, and everything goes away from it. V6 down here is put way over on Aaron's uh, left side. Okay, 
So all of my all of his electrical energy should be coming towards me. So all these waves should be nice and upright in V6. Okay? That's all you gotta know. You gotta know there's a P, a QRS, and a T, and V1 looks good and V6 looks good. Okay, we're gonna go look at examples now. So here's Patricia's first first one that look at. Again, these are all kids right here in Brevard County picked up. Okay? So what do we got here, Patricia? <laughs> So we'll just take it really simple across the bottom. We got a P, QRS, yeah? yeah. And then we got this T wave. Okay. okay? And we got that all the way across. So we know our rhythms. We got a normal rhythm, okay? Now in V1, we got we got this stuff all up here, okay? In V6, we got these huge forces over here, okay? And then if we come and look at our T wave on V6, we got these funky T waves that are all over the place here. Okay, they're up, they're down. Okay, so is P Patricia's big moment here. Are we normal or abnormal? I would say abnormal. Perfect, let's all give her a hand. <laughs> so you just saved a child's life by doing this, okay? This child had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, okay? They develop thickening of the heart muscle, okay? It can be in one place, it can be the whole heart, okay? Each child is different with that. You wanna go on to the next slide? Oh. I'm sorry, that's what there's a high uh, Your symptoms of a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, if you're a teenager, you can present with a, a, no teenager should present with a new murmur, okay? If you're taking a teenager in for a well child exam and they all of a sudden have a new heart murmur, they go get worked up because you don't know that they don't have this, okay? Babies commonly have murmurs. Your teenager should not have a new murmur, okay? Develop as a child in the teenagers. Shortness of breath with exertion or chest pain with exertion are other symptoms. So if they're running and they get short of breath or they um, pass out um, with exertion, uh, or the next one, would be the things that we worry about. But one in 500 people will have a gene for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it's more common than you think in the community, okay? With that. So who would like to be our second contestant today? We all learned together, so we're gonna help you through. Anyone? Come on. Come on. We need someone. Come on now. You just won the prizes, right? Come on. <laughs> and what's your name? Pleasure to meet you. Thank you for volunteering today. So Lisa's our second contestant here. Okay. So we got this EKG up. Again, done at a Brevard County School. You have P wave, QRS, T, so P, QRS, T, all the way across. So we got a normal rhythm, okay? In V1, everything's coming down. V6, coming up, but this T wave's way out here and kind of flipped. What are you gonna call it? Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Abnormal! Guess what? She just saved another life, okay? <laughs> So this patient had a condition called long QT syndrome. So patients, uh, some people will be born with a genetic defect where uh, the electrical properties of their heart need these little channels called ion channels where they let either sodium or potassium or calcium into the heart to electrically excite it. And if you're born with an abnormality in one of those, you can get changes on your EKG where the distance between this Q wave and the T wave lengthen compared to normal. And that can uh, put you at risk of going into sudden cardiac arrest. Again, if one person in the family has this, it can also run dominantly in families. So multiple uh, people can have this. Okay, so one child was picked up with this, but what they found was there was three other ones in the same family. Okay, so you had a 12 year old girl was singing at a chorus, or a chorus um, event, drop, EKG, long QT, because she went into an abnormal heart rhythm called ventricular uh, fibrillation. Okay, had to get shocked out of that. And her family has long QT. So not only her, she got diagnosed, but two of her siblings got diagnosed with this. Okay? Right here, Brevard County. Okay? Well, that's a volunteer to be third. You're saving lives, come on. <laughs> We're all friends. 
I'll help you through. But we got another contestant. Let's give it up for her. Monica. Thank you for coming down. Here we go. Okay, so this is our next EKG. So you got a P wave, a QRS, a T, a P, a QRS, T. You got a P. But what's that second one? Well, it, it's it's lengthening here, right? It doesn't look the same, right? And then you got a little blip on the back here. And then you got a P, a QRS, and a T. And then you got a P, but this distance doesn't look the same as this distance, right? Okay, you said you wanted to teach us. Yeah. So I'm going to go with y'all have been paying attention, right? So the examples that I remember you telling us, there should be the same distance on that or pretty much close to. I agree, I agree. So if I look at this and I see your P, your QRS, and the T, then they shouldn't be right on top of each other. So they're on top of each other and then there's this huge gap and they're back on top of each other. So I'm gonna guess to make, but you're the specialist. I'm saying there's probably a problem there. Exactly. So you're going abnormal. I'm gonna go with Crowd, what do you guys think? Abnormal. abnormal, there we go. Nice, okay, thank you. I'm going to the next one. So this child has heart block, okay? So you can have, again, this was a child playing sports. Didn't know, okay? Totally picked up, just the EKG. So uh, this child has a disease in the AV node. So normally beats cross from the top through the middle all the way down. Some people will inherently have a disease process that affects this AV node so that not all the beads can get across in a normal manner. So some people, first degree block means they slow down going across there, so the length is a little farther. Second degree block, you start dropping beads with that, and that's what this child had. And third degree block means no beads go across. So upper chambers beat, and then lower chambers beat separately, but they never talk with them. So this child's at risk for going from second to third degree over their lifetime. So they'll have to just get followed. They can keep playing sports, but they're gonna get followed over their lifetime because later on in life, as an adult, at some point, they'll probably buy themselves a pacemaker. Later in, okay? Let's keep going down. Okay, we got case four here. Who wants to do this one? Fine, it's fun. Oh, right here. What, 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 what do you guys? Fine. Give me a mic. What's your name? Bonnie. Bonnie. Okay, so Bonnie, Bonnie is our next contestant up here. So we got a P, a QRST, P, QRST, B, QRST, P, QRST, P, QRST. So you got a normal rhythm coming across, okay? But you got these wide beats up here, right? So if you come up here on lead one, you got a P and then this wide stuff. You don't have that nice little flat line that you that you typically expect. And over here, too, you can kind of see this thing's all wide. Do you say normal or abnormal? I'm going to go with abnormal. Abnormal. Crowd, what do you guys think? Abnormal. abnormal. <laughs> Can to give us our next slide, please? So this child has uh, a condition called Wolf Parkinson White. So anyone in the room have uh, SVT or supraventricular tachycardia where you have your heart race? One? Okay. So when you have normal heart electrical system, all of your electrical energy from these upper chambers should funnel through the center of the heart and then go down. Some people though will be born with an abnormal extra little pathway. It can sit on the right side or the left side of the heart. And if you go into, if, as electrical energy goes down the normal route then, it can cycle back up and create a loop. So these patients will go into sudden episodes of their heart racing. I don't know if that's what you experienced yeah. uh, with that. So uh, these can be cured by going in and doing an ablation procedure. So you take a catheter up into the heart, find the extra pathway and zap it with some electricity or freeze that little area. And then you're permanently cured. And then you don't have to worry about medications or anything ever again. Some of these pathways though, will allow electrical energy to pass from the upper chambers down to the lower chamber. So how many people here have a family member that's ever developed AFib? Okay, uh, I do too, okay? So a large percentage of the room. AFib means you go into a fast heart rhythm between these upper chambers, 
that's usually going at a rate somewhere close to 300. So it's, it's firing away real, real fast. Luckily, the center of your heart slows that electrical energy down and saves you. Because if you went 300 right to the lower chambers, you'd be dead in four minutes. But usually, the center of the heart slows that so that your rate's 150, maybe just a little over that. So you feel uncomfortable like you just ran a mile, but you're not dead, okay? But how many people have had a drink, had a couple of drinks, alcoholic drinks maybe, and all of a sudden felt your heart kind of flutter maybe the next morning or at night? Anyone? I know. I know probably there's a few other people out there. You had a little run of AFib, just so you know that. Alcohol induces AFib, okay? If you have one of these pathways and you go into AFib, if you're a college student and you go out and you binge drink, right? You go into a little run of AFib, it goes right to your ventricle, you're dead in four minutes. Okay? Sure. So these kids get an ablation procedure to get rid of that pathway to save their life. Okay? So they run a 1% risk of sudden cardiac arrest every year or two of that. But their EKG has this classic kind of upsloping on it. Okay? Want to do another one? Fire. Okay, good. Okay, so here we go. So by itself is always the second one. So we got B, we got QRS, we got T, B, QRS, T, B, QRS, T. Normal, okay, I like it. B1, everything going down. B6, everything coming up. Who are you gonna say, normal or everyone? That looks normal. Crowd? Normal, perfect. Okay, next slide. So this child had a totally normal EKG, okay? but can have a coronary abnormality, okay? So what's a heart attack mean to you, Bonnie? Uh, misfiring or an electrical misfire, the heart stops. Yeah. So on a heart attack, off of our aorta, where, this ox where our oxygenated blood is coming off, we have two little arteries called our coronary arteries. And they supply our heart muscle with oxygen and nutrients, okay? Over our lifetime, if we smoke, if we have diabetes, if we have high cholesterol, we can build up sludge or plaque build up in these arteries. Okay, so a heart attack means that one of these arteries gets completely blocked with sludge, okay? So if you've ever had a family member that's had to have a cath or bypass surgery because of um, coronary disease, that's because they built up blockage in one of these arteries and their heart muscle wasn't getting enough oxygen with that, okay? Some kids can be born and normally our coronary arteries, one comes off on the left, one should come off on the right. Some kids, though, will have both come off on the left. And if that happens, and you're exercising, you, your arteries expand during that time, so you can see this artery is going to get pinched here. Okay, but you'll have a normal EKG with that. Okay, so just realize um, EKGs will not capture every form of heart disease. Okay? Go on the next one. Okay, going to do another one, too? Okay, I'm sorry to throw them all in. Okay. A little difference here, right? So we got a little extra beat thrown in here, okay? How many people feel extra beats in themselves? You know, maybe you have a couple cups of coffee, maybe you have an energy drink, right? All of a sudden you kind of feel, feel an extra beat. 10% of us as normal healthy adults will have occasional extra beats, okay? We wouldn't restrict sports for this, but not a normal EKG, okay? Go on the next one. So uh, you can have extra beats from the upper chambers, like we just saw there, that these were premature atrial contractions, or you can have extra beats from the lower chambers with them. Again, not gonna, no one's gonna pass away from these, but again, not a normal EKG. Okay, you wanna go to the next one? So thank you, Bonnie, for helping us out today, and all of our other contestants. Uh, but I hope I left you within 30 minutes here that Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, your most common cause of sudden cardiac arrest, and uh, is, can be detected very uh, clearly by EKGs. Um, those sports with the highest risk of sudden cardiac arrest are, will be basketball. Um, in EKG screening programs, uh, when you look both in college and around the country, you're gonna expect 95% um, to be normal and 5% or less to be abnormal uh, with that. Um, and we're, they're very good at detecting hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, some forms of arrhythmia, Wolf-Parkinson-White, as you saw, um, but 
um, it is not 100% like that. Okay, so if your child is having symptoms or you have a strong family history, uh, you got to make sure your child is getting seen appropriately. Okay, so I hope I hope that helped you, and I hope you got EKG 101 in less than 30 minutes. So um, I hope you can all go out and read your own. EKG. Thank you so much. I I get EKGs now, so I'll be reading mine for, very proficiently, <laughs> I must say. But thank you so much for taking your time. And I want you to know, uh, Dr. Delani, this is his passion, and he does this work on his in his free time. And so I just want to tell you. So we have a couple questions. Okay, we can take a couple. Come on, step up here. If you could do it, um, get in line. That'd be awesome. That's good too. The question is, um, I know the Ward County is requiring 7th graders and older. At what age should you actually test your children? So well, at 10, I, I, 12? From a policy standpoint, I would leave all those questions to the, you know, the district and stuff well, with that. Well, as a suggestion. If it I depends on your family history, right? So if someone had a, a family member that had lung disease or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we follow them annually through, through puberty. Right you know for that so those, those kids get um if there is any potential that they're a gene carrier for one of those processes they get seen on an annual basis but otherwise seventh grade is pretty standard for you to start just to you have no idea of your family history or you just want to check yeah that, that's school district dependent so um you know obviously Brevard has put a policy in for that right. but um there are other counties that have also implemented policies there's also other countries that have implemented policies for EKG screening all at different times. There's no um, data to suggest when is the best time though to look. Okay, so if you do an EKG at one point, let's say you do it in eighth grade, just as an example, um, you know, could their heart change between entering before puberty and entering puberty? It is possible. So. Um, it's not a question, I just want to say thank you, Brevard, for doing this, because there's a girl on my daughter's dance team that is actually getting open heart surgery in two weeks because of this EKG, and wow. this $20 saved her life, and she would have never known, because she is, you just would have never known. So, I know some people are like, this is ridiculous, or some people are like, oh my gosh, you know, it's, it's unbelievable, and I know there's like five kids that are having things done in this county, and I would have never thought it would be some of my daughters know, and so, thank you so much. So if you know that you have history on both sides of your family that, you know, heart related, what should I be doing as a parent that's above and beyond the EKG, like making sure that my child's getting? Yeah, so if your history were coronary disease, right, so if people had had early heart attacks, things like that, then one, making sure they don't smoke, they lead a healthy life so that hopefully they don't develop diabetes over their lifetime and that they they get their cholesterol checked is uh, the important factors for that. So. Okay, go ahead. Um, one of the earlier slides you showed is that the whole checklist of 14 for like when you get the physical. So is that something that automatically is on a pediatric physical or do we have to specifically ask for that at the pediatrician's office when we go in? Um, most of your pediatricians would be doing that. So I can't speak for all of them, but um, when you take a uh, go to your pediatrician for your well child visit, they're catching the, those um, things in, in uh, most offices. I can't speak for every single pediatrician in the county. Thank you. My mother had a, she always called it a silent heart attack. The bottom of her heart died. But is there such a thing as a silent heart attack? I mean, what? can I expect from family? Yeah, so uh, there is a difference between men and women with uh, heart attack symptoms, so the women do get less symptoms. So, you know, in the movies, you all see men getting crushing chest pain, falling mm -hmm. over with chest pain with a heart attack. So women are um, much, uh, have much less clinical symptoms with that. So I, I have a personal friend, she had a heart attack. She sat home for six hours with this kind of discomfort. She has two uh, middle-aged kids, um, didn't want to go to the e ER with them, so then decided to go to an urgent care. 
and then got transferred to the ER, and then got transferred right to the cat lab, and now has two stents sitting in her artery with that. But um, uh, you, you will find a difference. Uh, you know, not everyone has overt crushing chest pain, um, you know, with a heart attack. It's not gonna be Thank you. One last question. This is actually directed toward the district. Uh, I'm a newbie. I recently relocated from Texas, so a lot of the policies are different. So I have the benefit of an outsider coming in and being like, oh, what's going on here? I totally appreciate the benefit of EKGs. I worry a little bit about access. And if it's another um, equity thing, I mean, if you have lower income people who are underinsured, how do we make sure that their kids can do this and this doesn't become like a class issue and who can participate in sports and who can't? So I'd appreciate just a, a response. To and you actually came from a great state because Texas was passed it for the whole state. Well, yeah, is that me? <laughs> Do you want to? Yeah. I, um, so in Brevard County, uh, who we play for, we're a nonprofit. Uh, thanks to grants from uh, Parish Health First, uh, the Brevard Health Alliance, um, and a few others, we any uh, family who cannot afford it, uh, free and reduced lunch, uh, we. Thanks to those grants, we're able to deliver those ECGs for free to those families. So that's so there really is no kid in Brevard County uh, specifically who wouldn't be able to get an ECG. Uh, thanks to the uh, our community. Yeah, and yeah, so we go out to all of the Brevard County schools uh, that have athletics, and we provide those uh, ECGs. Um, but real quick, I did want to do a pretty big shout out, Dr. Delani here. Uh, since June has read over 4,200 ECGs, uh, all as a volunteer for us. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's kind of ironic where we're going right now, but we're going to have a presentation about the heart of Brevard. <laughs> Talk about a segue. So I'm very pleased to introduce to you Nikki Ensley. Can you all hear me? How are we doing this morning? That was a pretty awesome presentation. Especially, I'm a mom of two, and my 10-year-old just got screened, and my 13-year-old, because we do have on both sides of our family. So, and he'll be re-screened when he gets older with puberty and that. But who we play for is amazing. So, part of Brevard. Who's heard about it? Show of hands. <sighs> We're not doing a good enough job. Okay. Actually, um, we started what we call kind of a soft launch. You have a magazine in front of you. Yeah. This is our new magazine. So when we started planning for the new school year, we started thinking about how can we better, and, and we always ask this question, but how can we better show the great work of our district, the great work of the people behind our district? I mean, we are an A school district. We are one of the top districts in the state. Um, you've all hopefully seen the numbers that have come out from our schools and our district ratings. How do we tell that story better? And how do we frame it in a way that kind of brands us? We have a unique position being here on the Space Coast. We're graduating kids that are staying, they're career ready, they're college ready. They're, you know, interning at the Lockheed Martins and the, and the Grumman's. How do we capture this in a way where it resonates larger than just our schools, our school community, but community-wide? We have, I think, over 700 business partners in Brevard County, um, our partners in education, faith-based leaders, community leaders, how do we bring them under the tent of what we do and gain support? How do we get the support of our parents who are active in our schools and providing such an amazing service volunteering? So we thought about that. And then we thought about, what do we call it? How do we, should we name it something? Should it be something big? Should it be impactful? Should it be an actual campaign versus a project? And so we decided, let's, let's look at a campaign. What are, the, what are the qualities that make up the campaign? We talked about the students, right? The students that are gonna be the next leaders and healers and artists and athletes and thinkers and builders. And we thought, these, these, this is the future of Brevard. Who, who is, 
helping to develop that future. It's our teachers. Who's supporting our teachers? It's our families and our business partners and the entire community. And really, we are at the heart of everything in Brevard County. Would you agree? I mean, education, public education, 74,000 students. We're really a part of everything we do in this county and hopefully for future generations to come. So we talked about the fact that we're develop developing the next generation of career and college ready citizens. And our schools are beneficiaries of volunteerism from you all and so many more. Drivers of property values and wealth and neighborhood pride. Our teachers are world class. They're the reason why we have the A rating that we do. So we're really at the heart of everything in this county. I like to think so. And so we started thinking about, well, how do we get our publications to a wider audience? Everybody familiar with BPS News, our monthly publication? Erase it from your minds, it doesn't exist anymore, sorry. Um, what we wanted to do was create something more impactful, something that could get in your actual hands like you have today. And so we took the whole notion of Heart of Brevard and we thought, that'd be a great magazine title. And we looked at a lot of different counties that have magazines for their districts. We looked at the magazines that our communities are putting out, our nonprofits put out, and we thought, we could do this, but we need support to do it. We don't want to spend um, unnecessary dollars that we don't have on the production of such an item. But we have a natural built-in funding mechanism, and that's the beauty of advertising. And everyone in this magazine, every ad that you see is one of our community partners who are helping to produce this magazine and get it into the hands of more people. So when you go to your doctor's office or your dentist office, your pediatrician, college campuses now, you will hopefully see Heart of Brevard. It's just starting to get out there now. This is our inaugural issue. Um, we've moved to a quarterly format to allow for more high impact reporting, if you will, stories that mean something to our readers, to all of you, um, high end, so you don't have to read it in a digital flipbook version like you had to with BPS News, allow more opportunities for our business partners to advertise, um, and more opportunities to feature the wealth of talent that we have, both in educators and staff and students. And so I hope you all will take a moment, if you're not familiar with the magazine, and read through it. It's an ever-evolving process. We actually, the interest in this magazine, we've been getting calls all week from potential advertisers, so we already know we're actually moving to an even larger format for the winter edition. So we're very excited about the launch, but this is only the first phase of Heart of Brevard. Heart of Brevard, the rollout and where we, where you will start seeing profiles of the people behind the district, the people behind the schools, will be across all of our media. So that's our district Facebook page, our district website now has a button on it that you can click on and you can submit a teacher, an administrator, staff member of the district, a custodian, cafeteria member, crossing guard. Um, We've had students already submitting, and parents. Um, we've had administrative um, principals and assistant principals submitting, recognizing people for the work that they've done, kind of our unsung heroes. And so you will start seeing profiles already in BPS headlines. Who's familiar with BPS headlines that goes out every week? Better. So hopefully, I think you're all on the distribution list for BPS Headlines. That's our weekly digital newsletter. And so there's a section in there called Heart of Brevard and we'll profile one, it might go to more. <laughs> we started getting, we have stacks now of nominees, which is a good problem to have. So we put it out across there. BPS Insider goes straight to staff. So our teachers get it, our district, all of our employees, 4,300, 4,400 employees get our Insider. So we do profiles in there as well. And we'll be doing a lot of more internal focus on our employees as well. Um, if you have someone who's made a difference and you want to submit, these are the avenues that you can do that. Um, you can go in BPS headlines, there's a link and the web page, or you can go to gotheart at brevardschools.org. And we'd love to see 
and to hear about more people doing the right work of our district. This is just some of the profiles that we've had. And there's different formats. We put them out across social media, our publications. We've got a lot more coming up. OK, so here's the meat and potatoes. And I need you to all take an oath right now that this goes nowhere. This is kept amongst ourselves. Okay. So we are launching our larger part of this campaign, more of our community-focused campaign, starting Monday. Very soon, they're still in production. Our print shop's a little bit behind. But everything you see, this, this magazine is produced by our print shop in-house. They are going to be producing these I Am The Heart of Brevard window clings that every single BPS employee will be getting, because every single one of us is the Heart of Brevard. And our board members, of course, will be getting. So <laughs> that will come soon. It's a little bit backlogged over there. Again. All of these things funded by our business partners. So we can do these things because of the community. Um, and we can recognize and, and hopefully reward the best of the best here in Brevard Public Schools with these things. So every employee will be getting up very soon. So hopefully you'll start seeing them when you're out and about. And now the big secret. Monday morning, our teachers are going to be getting video messages, and this is part of a series to recognize our educators. And so we've had high-profile members of the community coming in for the last three weeks into our offices, and pro we're producing these video messages. We've asked them to tell us why our teachers are the heart of Brevard. And so this is going to be the first one from Sheriff Ivy, but we've got uh, president of Space Coast Association of Realtors, all of our Chamber of Commerce leaders, legislators, um, it runs the gambit. And so over the course, we're going to try to get these out on a weekly basis, and they will come via email to our teachers. You won't see it unless our teachers are sharing it, and we want them to share it. We want them to feel proud of the work that they're doing. So this is special for them. Hello everyone, I'm Sheriff Wayne Ivey, and this is Judy, our mascot at the Brevard County Sheriff's Office. I'm extremely proud to have the first opportunity to brag about our public school teachers, and to also tell everyone why I believe our teachers are the heart and soul of this great county of Florida. You know, growing up in Florida, school was a huge part of my life, from both academics and sports. In fact, my mom felt that school was so important, she actually became a school bus driver, so she could drive me to and from school each and every day. I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. My mom knew, even back then, how big a role our teachers play in the lives of our next generation of leaders. Throughout my life, I've been blessed to have so many inspirational teachers who each made a huge impact in my life and helped shape me into the person I am today. That's why I want to make sure that each of you know how much our community values all that you do in helping shape the future of the city's goods. Teachers are superheroes in my book as you go to work each and every day with an open heart and unwavering spirit to inspire your students while helping them to achieve their true potential. So on behalf of our entire agency, Juni, and our community, thank you for your tireless dedication and for being the heart of the park. So that is one of many, I think we've got 10 weeks worth right now of video messages, and all of them are different. Um, Greg Pallone, a reporter for um, News 13, actually did something out at Kennedy Space Center. So we actually asked Sheriff Ivey to, to do this. He came in, he's a very fast read. We had to slow that up. That's how fast it was. So little little note, but we are grateful to all of um, the community leaders who have come and, and filmed these videos and who are scheduled to do it. Um, we hope it'll be re well received and be meaningful to our teachers. Uh, so that starts Monday morning, and we'll keep you posted on that campaign. And then the bigger piece that we hope involves all of you and so many more is our community campaign. This is, um, we're calling it our print campaign. Our, it's a project. And it's the Heart of Brevard project. And what we are starting to do is take photographs, black and white photographs, of the heart and hands that kind of mirror the cover of our magazine, our inaugural issue of the magazine. And no branding, no Heart of Brevard, just, just that photo in portraits. And you'll start to see them throughout the community. We're hoping around the holidays. We'll have photographers set up. We're working out where there'll be sessions in some of the well-traveled restaurants and different public areas where you yourselves
can come up and, and have your photo taken in support of public education in Brevard County and the people that make public education work. So our teachers and everyone that's involved, our staff, um, everyone involved in Brevard Public Schools. And so hopefully you'll start to see these posters in places of business and government offices. That's the goal and we're working through our community network to do that. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. Um, it's a year long campaign, so we're just getting off the ground now. And it's my baby, so I'm very proud of it. <laughs> we're finally happy to be, it's been in planning for so long, so we're finally happy to be getting it off the ground. And we do hope that you all participate at some level, whether submitting a Heart of Brevard profile submission or taking part in the print campaign. And we'll be getting this information out to you on how to participate in this very soon. We're just setting everything up now. Any questions? What's your, what's your contact info? My okay. specific? Yep. Or, it's Hensley, H-E-N-S-L-E-Y, dot Jennifer, at BrevardSchools.org. So Thank you. So now you know you have a secret. You're the first to know. Um, and we're very excited about the campaign. And so how many of you are aware of Focus? Okay. How many of you have the Focus app? Wow. We're, what a group. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. Because one thing we saw in the parent surveys, we saw that parents were saying, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about focus and what, what about this focus app. So it sounds like a lot of you are plugged in. So what we'd like you to do is make sure you carry this back to your schools because it doesn't seem like maybe everybody is as, as aware of it as you are. So I'm happy to introduce Rochelle Schneider and Don Bronson and, and the team to um, talk about focus. Um, good morning, my name is Dawn Bronstein. I am one of the technology integrators. There is a team of eight of us, and we provide training and support for teachers with instructional technology applications. And some of my team members here, we have Rochelle Schneider, Ann Graham, and Tam Rutenberg in the back. And one of our tasks is to provide training and support to teachers using the Focus Gradebook. So we're just about at our one year anniversary from rollout, and we think it's gone pretty well but one feature of the app that we think is really important is that parent engagement piece. And so we've made it this year a focus of ours to try to get more parents engaged on the app to set up accounts. So it looks like most of you have accounts. Right now, I looked at the statistics this morning, we're at about 50%. We've passed just the 50% mark of parents going out and creating accounts. Um, we would like to get that higher. I think we've hit that point where parents are starting to hear about it. In the last two weeks, we've increased by over a thousand a week. I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. I know it's going out, but I happen to know there's a lot of parents that like ask me, how do you work this? And what exactly are we supposed to do? And I'm going to show and you I that. I know we have these letters that mm -hmm. came out, and I'm wondering if maybe there was an availability for one of y'all to have something to where you can, you know, send something out to the parents and go, hey, if y'all want to know how exactly to work this, we'll have a workshop for a day to help you and explain to you how to do that. Because not, well, exceptions pending, not all of us are technical savvy. Some of us can figure it out right off the bat and others need extra help. Yeah, and we'll, we'll take, I'll take that feedback back to the team and we'll figure out some things we can do. One of the things we're doing is, um, I was already out at a church in the community recently where I live demonstrated for parents. I'm here now to live demonstrate, give you some troubleshooting tips that hopefully you can share in places people can go for help. And we're gonna continue that campaign to get um, parents their account. So um, a lot of you already know the process and I'm, I'm assuming you already appreciate the importance of the app for communication, so I'll move past that. But to register the parent account, there's four things that um, the parent needs. So they have to have a valid email address. They have to know their student's ID number and they can ask the school for that. They have to know the birth date and then they have to have that PIN letter, which is I believe the letter you were talking about from the school. That's the security piece. You cannot register a child unless you have that PIN letter and they're gonna ask for ID to make sure you're a custodial parent before you get that PIN number for your student. 
Um, there's two ways you can access Focus. There's the desktop version that I'm showing now on the computer. We also now have the mobile app. We rolled out the mobile app in August, and I checked this morning, it's been downloaded 27,346 times since August. So it's getting out there. Um, to get to Focus, if you go to the website, www.mcardschools.org, there is a Focus link at the top, and that will take parents to the login page. And then on the sign-in page, there, is a, there are a lot of resources. There is, click here, there is a um, parent resource that shows step-by-step -step with screenshots how to register the account. So it's right there. So www.mcardschools.org, it's the district website. Right up at the top, we have the focus button. We wanted it front and center, because we want it to be a first place parents go. Once you click on that link, this is a screen you'll see. Right here, it says click here if you'd like the directions. Those are directions with screenshots that tell you exactly what you're gonna get step by step as you register that account. Obviously, you have to have that PIN number before you come here. Um, also here, you'll see, click here to create the parent portal account. That's when you have the PIN number. That's the first place you click to put in that PIN number and all that other identifying information. Um, it will take you through a process of adding your child. And if you have multiple children, you can add them then. <clears throat> one item we're finding, though, is sometimes what happens is the parents have one PIN letter and they go create the account. and They don't have it for their second child. They have to go to the school and get that. When they come back, they would go to that link right there that says click here to add a child. And that'll take them through the process with the second PIN number. And finally, if parents forget their password, it's a password reset just like any other map app now where you go in and you click on it and it sends you that email. So I'm gonna show you a um, simulated version when you log in. And, and it sounds like most of you have seen this, but the information that it's, that's available in here is really incredible now. So you have alerts if teachers are posting assignments in their gradebook before they're due. You'll get an alert when assignments are coming due. And know that your children also on their Launchpad accounts, they have a link that they can click and they can get this too, to empower them to also learn, start to learn those self-advocacy skills with their, with their gradebook. Um, messages can be sent out. This is a message from us. And right here, focus website for parents and students, that's another resource. We have all kinds of handouts there. So if you want some handouts to share with parents, you can click there and you'll find all kinds of resources there, a website you can send out. If you have a parent list, take that link, send it out, it will give them all our resources. Um, you can sign up for email notifications, daily, weekly, or you can customize if the grade goes before below a certain level, I wanna be notified. Um, and you pick the email address that's sent to you. Some parents want to register with their home email address and then have those emails go to their work address, and that's where you can set that. Um, featured programs is really the highlight, and that's where you can see um, the percent average in every class. Teachers can create an internal web page here that you have to log in. Um, if I click on the percent for the class, it will actually tell you assignment by assignment what's in there that hasn't been graded, what's been graded, what the average is. Um, to get home, you all have the BPS logo here, not this practice logo that we have for what I'm using. That always takes you back to that home page. You can email the teachers directly through this app. If I click on it, I get an email page. It'll email it to the teacher's Brevard School's email address. In terms of web pages, if a teacher has a web page, so this is a biology teacher. Every week she posts an agenda of what's happening that week. And then under resources right now, parents can or um, teachers can post um, lessons, anything they need to get out to their students and to parents. So um, a lot of the elementary teachers who aren't using the grade book as much are posting newsletters to this section. So a weekly newsletter that goes out. Um, one more thing I'd like to point out before we move on and talk about the mobile app very quickly is notice on the left these flyout menus you can get to so much more information here. Um, you have a test history, you have class schedules, you have attendance all listed right here at your fingertips 
moving through those um, areas. And child info is very important because here you have, under addresses and contacts, this is everything we have on record of all the contacts for the child. So the gavel shows you who the custodial parents are, um, emergency contact we have uh, with the yellow triangle, and who has pickup is the green car. So you can actually review all that information and see what we have on file if there's anything we need to um, change. You would have to contact the school to get it changed. Right here are the linked users. So parents have, have um, talked to me about concern, well, someone else can get that PIN number and get information about my child. Once you register an account, anytime someone else registers an account linked to your child, you will get an email, and it'll say someone just registered an account that's linked to your child, and right here you can see every parent who's linked to that child. So that's the desktop app. Now the mobile app, you see what the icon looks like here. So if you have not downloaded the mobile app yet, um, it's available in the um, Apple or Google Play Store. That's what the icon looks like. This is not replacing BPS Mobile. So if you have BPS Mobile, we're using both right now. BPS Mobile is still what we use for emergency call out, so you don't want to get rid of that. This will get you to the gradebook information. I'll give you a real quick view of that. So when you log in, you get the overview screen, you get the classes, you get the grades. Um, you can drill down, and I'm going to go into the one we did before, the biology, with the um, web page. And here what it does is it combines the web page information and the class grades. And you will see here, um, the A is the student got an A grade on that assignment and then it has the name of this assignment. So that's how grades are listed and the grades have been confusing some people about where they are. Um, there are more panels in here if I swipe through. There's a news panel here. So this is connected to any children that you connect to, whatever schools they're in. This will pull um, certain pages from the school website and update the news live here for you. If the school has social media feeds, Twitter or um, Facebook, and they link them, you can go in and sign up for those and receive all of that right here. We also have some links that we send out from the district. And this messenger feature is outgoing messages from students to parents or to, or from teachers to parents or to their students. Usually they're using them for batch messages. It's not a two-way, you can't chat with the teacher. We don't have that turned on if I try to click new message and choose a teacher. It says at the bottom that messaging is disabled. But teachers can send messages out to you. And if you have notifications allowed through this app, they'll actually be the little pop-ups like you get if you have any news notifications coming up. So you'll see those come as pop-ups. Um, last thing I want to show you about the app is if you go to, notice I went to the um, hamburger menu on the left, and settings, this is where you can sign up for more feeds. So community members can download the app also. They're not going to be connected to children if they don't have any children in the school system, but they can go to the settings and they can sign up to receive those news feeds from the school, and then that news section will um, populate. So you can sign up. If you have a child who's in elementary this year or going to middle next, you can sign up for those news feeds at the middle school and kind of start to see what kind of events are happening throughout the year. So that's kind of a nice feature of the app. And in terms of information, we have a few more places that you can get some information. If you go to our website again and you go to the parents and students link, which is right up at the top at BrevardSchools.org, there is a focused parent information link, and that has a link to our website with um, all of our information and our handouts. Again, another place to get that if you need those. Yes, sir. I appreciate you pointing out where we can go get information. To be quite honest, I'm rather busy, mm -hmm. and I don't have the time to go figure out what's wrong with that. And I say this, seeing that all these wonderful teachers are trying to come on and show us, and it's a very long explanation about what it is it does and how wonderful it is. I could turn mine on for you right now, and there's nothing on it. So I don't know where the disconnect is. Is the disconnect that you're not properly teaching teachers how to use it? 
they're not using it, you're not giving them sufficient time, or you're just asking, hey, by the way, this is important, figure it out on your own time kind of thing. Because they need to be able to teach us, the parents, how to use it. And right now, I can hand you my phone, and you would see nothing on there. So my question is, are you adequately bringing it to the teachers and giving them sufficient time and say, hey, look, we're going to bring you in, we're going to show you everything how to do it, and you can pass this information off to parents. Because I'm just one parent from one school here. And if I look behind me and I say, hey, everybody can raise their hand right now and say, do you get the information from this? I think hands would go up. Is anyone have, else having trouble where there's nothing on the app? Nothing on the app at all. So there's a couple, there's a couple possible. So I see like three or four. Um, we are happy to help you with that, and you can talk to one of my colleagues back here and figure it oh, out. But, but so like possibly sending us to a website is not the answer. Right. Well, and that's if teachers aren't posting grades. That's that's a whole other issue. Which brings me back to: Are you guys teaching them? Do you take yes. them in and, and properly showcase how to use the app? And what grade is uh, it? Well, in kindergarten, second grade, you're going to have much less use of the app in terms of grades being posted because we don't give percentile letter grades. So let me let me have one of my colleagues help you, and let's get you on the news feeds at least from your school, so we can get those. And and always it's important to start with your school, start with the teacher. And, and, and talk to them about, hey, and sometimes, you know, it's just that conversation can help resolve the challenges you're having. So always start with that classroom teacher and, and ask them. And, and thank you for going to the mic. Do you have a question? Um, yes, I um, am having, I think Focus is extremely user friendly and I use it all the time. And I see that our district probably spent a lot of money and time implementing this. Is there any way our district can encourage to say a nice word our teachers to use this as their only form of communication um, as middle school and high school students become more busy active have multiple teachers they're all using whatever they like to use for communication um, different apps and our students already have so much to juggle and if they can have just one resource like focus some teachers do post all their homework and the extracurricular and extra credit on there, but not all do. It would be wonderful if the district can, like I said, encourage the teachers to just use, just use Focus and no other apps. Well, that certainly is a great suggestion and part of a journey that we'll see if we're taking, you guys could answer better than I can, but. We're, we're training the teachers. So remember, we're at one year that we've implemented this. So um, the teachers are training. I think they're starting to see the value of it. Focus is releasing more features. So as we're able to get out there, there are the eight of us. We are each assigned a group of schools. So if you talk to your t the teachers and say, hey, it's really difficult for me to access information from all of these different places, because sometimes they just don't realize how many places you have to go. They're just trying to communicate with you. But if you give them that feedback and say, you know, this other teacher uses Focus and it would be great if I could get all this information through Focus, why don't you talk to your technology integrator? They can come to us, we're assigned to each school, every school has one, and we can show them how to use Focus. And, and we do go out there and talk about the program and its benefits, but if you can help with that too, we would appreciate that. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say we're here um, with Ralph Williams Elementary and we were just going over the social media settings in the Focus app, and our school is not listed. Um, schools who have Facebook or Twitter accounts um, can send us that information. We will add them. We have passed that out to the schools. Um, the information that they can, what they need to give us, to have that added to the app. Some schools have Facebook and Twitter accounts. Others don't. So it's just up to the school to be added. It's not like just well, headlines and features are there. Headlines and features in school news are there for every single school. That is an RSS feed from their website, so, and they know this. Anything they update on the um, left-hand side of the website next to that big multimedia gallery or the school news portion on that homepage, anytime they update that, that does feed to the app. Yes. I know from our school, Pinewood, 
some parents have gave us feedback that yeah they're not getting certain feature if they click on it stuff stuff doesn't pop in it could be a teacher that's and we're talking about the mobile app now yes okay um certain assignments maybe weren't showing up also i know that my third grader and my fifth grader in the years past teachers tend to use class dojo so a lot of those teachers will use that and that's where sometimes i get most of my information rather than the focus app i do get their graded percentage and their letter grades but it could be the teachers prefer to use a outside app unfortunately so it could be in that case as well with your younger kids because it isn't the same as they progress yeah, and you saw, once I get to middle and high school, I'd be surprised if you're not getting weekly updates, and, and even fifth and sixth grade, I hope you're getting a lot ha more happening. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I've asked the question, are these tools optional for the teachers or the different schools? I've been told, yes, that it is an optional. For instance, the binder is optional. They don't have to write in it. They don't have to communicate in it. That's what I've been told. I am a reservist, a major in the Army Reserves, and it is hard for me when I leave my kids, when I leave each month, to distinguish which teacher is communicating which site and all this, because I have limited resources, a secure area where I have to make sure I, because I have to be a parent when I'm away. <laughs> so um, when I look at the binder, there's nothing. The communication, I have to take uh, FaceTime, you know, so there's so much going on, but they're telling me it's optional. Is Focus optional also? Focus is a district grade book program. Okay. It is what we are using for state grade reporting. So the grade piece of that is not optional. That's where grades are going in. Every teacher puts in, at least at the end of every quarter, a grade. So that, that piece is not optional. That's where those are going in. We do have representatives here from Leading and Learning who are listening to your feedback and will take this back to their, to their groups thank you. about what you're saying about different places to communicate. Yes, thank you. Okay, I, I, so. Can I say something though about the emails about focus groups? Go ahead, go ahead. Um, last year I would email, I click on the links for the email for the teachers and I wouldn't hear back. So, you know, then I was like, well, if you're not hearing back, so then I would actually go to the bar or whatever the school website is and click on that. And they did not receive the focus emails. They said they went to spam. I'm sure yeah. there's a lot yeah. of technical stuff, mm -hmm. but I just was gonna say for the teachers that are teaching your kids, sometimes you just need to give them a day because they might not get that email. And if they don't respond to you, follow up, it's not always like, on them. And, I, I, and I'm not kind of- We did have that happen when we first, you know, when you roll out any new product, you could email the teachers. All those emails, because they were coming from Focus, were going to the teacher spam folders, some teacher spam folders, not, not every teacher. It took us a while to, to solve that. Then we had to get to our IT people, and they had to, to whitelist the rules to make sure that doesn't happen. If you don't hear back, I was a teacher for many, many years. I still am a teacher. I just teach teachers. Um, if you don't hear back from someone in 24 hours, please call them because sometimes I would not get messages for a variety of reasons and the parents would call me and I would feel terrible, but I felt even worse if a parent waited for, for a period of time before they got to me thinking I wasn't getting back to them. The vast majority of my colleagues out there want to communicate with you and if they're not getting back to you, there's probably a reason. Okay, I just want to say what a fabulous, robust conversation. And I, I am so excited about this team because you are asking questions. And I know we still have some questions. Do you mind stepping in the back of the room and, and allowing them to ask you these questions? Because they're really important. And then maybe giving us the feedback we can share out. So your questions will be answered, definitely. We're running a little behind in our uh, agenda. But I appreciate you guys asking all these great questions. So we're going to move on right now to um, how many of you have heard of the organization Counselors for Change? Okay, I see a few hands. Well, after today, I really hope all of you are going to know a lot more about them. And just a bit of a teaser, they are going to be presenting at our parenting workshop, which is tomorrow. And they have incredibly valuable information to share about mental health, which is a very important topic we should all be talking about as it relates to ourselves and our children. So come on up, Stephanie Bird and, and Tiffany Trudeau.
So thanks, Focus team. I just downloaded my Focus app, which I didn't know there was an app. Back in the day, I got a report card in a manila envelope. <laughs> yes. And my parents just waited. Um, so yes. it's nice to have access if we want access. Um, Jenny, first of all, thanks for having us here. I'm Stephanie Bird. I began my career right here. I was a teacher at Meadow Lane for six or seven years, 20 plus years ago. And I love teaching, I love working with kids and families, but what I found very early on was a lot of the academic challenges and the social emotional challenges were outside of what I could do as a teacher in the time that I had to work with the students. And so I went back to school and did my graduate degree in marriage and family therapy and then some postgraduate work in the neurobiology of trauma. So I've been in private practice for a while, but I've always wanted to go back and figure out how to implement some mental health support in the classroom. So this is where Counselors for Change, that idea that came up 20 plus years ago, began to take root. And I will let Tiffany introduce herself because we're both on the board of <laughs> okay, I'm Tiffany Trudeau, and as Stephanie said, I sit on the board with her for Counselors for Change. I was not an educator um, in my former life, but I am a parent, and so I, when she and I started really talking about mental health and mental health in the schools and helping our students and how if a student is anxious or depressed or is having a mental health issue that it is so much more challenging for them to learn their the material that's being presented to them by the, the phenomenal teachers that are sort of at that in that role for them. So I definitely wanted to, to join her. And so again, I'm a, I'm a mother of two elementary school little girls. And so want them to be in the safest and most mental healthiest environments as possible. Sure. <laughs> I just made that up, mental healthiest. Um, grammar teachers are probably wagging their finger right now somewhere. But I am also the president of the Space Coast Mental Health Counselors Association. And so we'll talk a little bit about how the Space Coast Counselors Association partners with Counselors for Change so that you guys have even, even more resources. I also am in private practice here in the Sun Tree area and do work with trauma and do a lot of work with military families. I think our military families kind of get missed and looked over because they can be so transitional and they're not in the area for a long time. And so really wanting to connect with the base and the military families as well. Um, so I'll hand it back to you. And we're both really grateful to be here because it's my understanding that you are the leaders that are representing the schools across the county, which means you're volunteering your time, your energy and passion to make a huge difference in the lives of your children, but also the lives of your school, and therefore our community. And I love this quote by Wendell Berry. It's been up, I'm, I'll let you read it. I don't like being read too when I'm doing a PowerPoint, but it really does demonstrate the fact that we are all connected in making any form of long and lasting change. And what I know about, I mean, our belief in mental health is it is at the center of our individual and collective well-being and we cannot miss the mark for kids. And so, bear with me, I am not a tech. Okay. So leading into that, our mission has been to increase mental health awareness, education, outreach, and advocacy to school-aged youth and those entrusted with their care. And when we look at what, who are those entrusted with their care, it's every human on earth. And so we really want to partner with all the mental health professionals but also all of the community members. We have students on our boards and teachers and um, parents who volunteer and certainly a lot of mental health professionals, but it takes that sort of community effort to make the kind of change that we need to be making. Um, and you know, the vision would be to, that everyone in the world, not just Brevard County, has early and ongoing access to mental health care. So certainly, like I mentioned, collaboration is key. Um, we live in a very individualized, individualistic society where independence is kind of put above all else. And we know as far as mental health goes, 
communities that have more of a collectivist nature have lower mental health distress. And parenting is really hard. I'm a parent of three, and I'm about to be a grandparent in April, which blows my mind. Um, but that journey is not an easy one, and I feel like I have lots of support systems in place, and not everybody does, and it's in the schools that teachers and leaders like you who are integrated into the school and kind of have their pulse on the energy can tap into where some needs are, and you can communicate with us, and we can collaborate together. So we don't want anybody feeling like they're parenting alone or grown up alone. Uh, let's see. And so our definition of a counselor is one who advocates for the well-being of another. Everybody in this room, based on your position in your school, is a counselor. You're advocating for the well-being of the students in your school. And so in that, with that mindset, we're hoping to share with you today some ways that we can help you in your school and collaborate with you, but also to get you involved with us. And if, this, if mental health is something you value, um, then reach out to us and see about ways that we can work together on all our projects. And these are some of them. Um, conversations for change. This had, we do panel discussions at schools. We've done a couple last year. We have one in November. Um, and what that is, we've done them at um, PTA meetings. And prior to the PTA meeting, we will have parents get any questions they want answered regarding mental health. We typically have four to six mental health professionals on a panel and we answer the questions anonymously so they can send them in, we go over them, we clump them together and then answer those to the parents in the school. This year because more people are finding out about us, we don't have the resources to do like a PTA meeting at every school. So we're hoping that we could do four in each part of the county or four total. If we can figure out how to do more, we will figure out how to do more, but do four total in each part of the county so that um, whoever, whatever school is hosting it is going to invite other schools. So ideally they have an auditorium or somewhere that they can do that. And then like Jenny had mentioned, we're doing um, Parent University tomorrow where we have five or six professionals coming up and just teaching tools for mental wellness. And ideally, the parents that are here are going to take those home and teach their kids and maybe go out to your schools and volunteer in a classroom and teach them some of that. But in order to teach our kids anything, they listen by watching. And so those tools that we're teaching tomorrow, we really want parents going home and integrating them into their habits, into their lifestyle because you can tell a child to belly breathe all day long, but if you're not, they're not going to because they don't see the value in it. Um, so hopefully those of you who can make it will come up tomorrow and we'll do some of those. Um, posters for change. Tiffany will be talking a bit about, more about that. Our first annual contest was last year. It was open to all sixth through 12th grade, public, private, and homeschool students. Six finalists. Um, earned a hundred dollar scholarship through partnerships that we have two minutes okay um, and so Tiffany will very quickly do that we have some walks coming up um, you can take a picture and maybe go on our Facebook page and find out more about that and then um, some other things that we do in the community but we're trying to hit students parents community and the initiatives we have that we're going out into the community to do so a poster contest. Thank you. So I know I have now a minute and 45 seconds. Um, so as Stephanie was saying, we did this poster contest and this past school year, 2018-2019 um, is when we first launched it. And so what we did is we put the information out to students, grades six through 12, that they could create a poster in any type of media so they could draw it, they could do it digitally, but a poster that was going to communicate something about <clears throat> mental health awareness, and then we voted on those. And as Stephanie said, we had finalists, they got a financial award, we went and awarded them in person at their, at their school and put a picture of them um, on our Facebook page, we did get permission for that. And it really was something to let kids start thinking about mental health and start thinking about it in a different way, not just 
having a handout that's just written, you know, with words that they're going to just scan over and it's going to end up in the bottom of their book bag, but that they can actually start to think about mental health and start incorporating some of the tools. Um, so we're going to be doing it again because we had such a positive response and we just think that the message is amazing and letting the kids sort of drive the message home and because we made posters, they're available for purchase. People can get these posters and they can post them at their businesses. Teachers can post them in their class. We're getting some guidance counselors to try to post them in some of the administrative offices at the school. So again, that this conversation is ongoing. And so we're gonna be launching for this school year, 2019-2020 in December. And then we're gonna be announcing winners in February of 2020. And so, as parents, how can you guys get involved? Well, you guys can encourage your students to participate. You can also maybe volunteer to help us to uh, review the submissions so that we can come up with our award winners. Because again, we really want to have this collaborative and ongoing conversation with parents and with students about mental health. And not that we're doing it reactionarily, Another word I just made up, guys. I get up here, I start making it up. Preventatively is probably better. Um, and not that it's after some terrible thing has happened. We're trying to get in there um, ahead of that. So the poster contest is one of the ways. You guys can also volunteer by joining us at any of our meetings. They are open because as Stephanie said, we are licensed professional counselors and she is a licensed married and family therapist. But you guys are all counselors as well. And so we want to have you guys join us and have your voice be heard and collaborate with you in our efforts as well. So that's it, period. You can get on the Facebook page. That's kind of the only technology we 40 plus year olds know how to use and that's a stretch. <laughs> so, oh, I'm sorry, you're not there yet. <laughs> um, so Facebook will be posting stuff about the poster contest and everything else. If you want to take a picture of that, and that those are some ways that you can get involved as well. And we'll have a sign up sheet if you want more information. But thanks for having us, and thanks for all that you're doing in the schools. Thank you. Their Facebook page is amazing. I learn from it every day I look at it. Okay, so don't move because I could be fired if you do. Uh, we saved till the end one of our school board members. Ms. Campbell, who's in District 5, I believe. And I, it appears our superintendent has already stepped in as well. So hello, Dr. Mullins. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And just to be clear, I can't fire Ms. Gleason. I can only fire him. So, <laughs> so my name is Katie Campbell, and I am uh, one of your school board representatives. If you live in the South End, Palm Bay, West Malden area, I'm most likely your representative. But we do work for all the kids in the county. And so um, thank you for putting that up. You should have in your packet of information this kind of beige color sheet. And that's, uh, I'm just going to refer you to that. Sometimes as parents, and by the way, I have three kids. This year I have a high schooler, a middle schooler, and an elementary schooler, so I'm in all your boats, right? Um, sometimes we get so much and we don't really read through, and I am one of those people who does read through everything eventually. Um, and this sheet you actually had access to before because somewhere towards the beginning of the year you received something called a parent resource guide, usually through Peach Jar. Now, I saw some head nods, yay, people are reading stuff, that's good. In the very back, there's this page right here. So the reason why I bring this up is because as a school board member, sometimes, believe it or not, have parents who they decide, for example, their child's getting too much homework. And their first response, occasionally, is to call me or to email me. I do not mind taking those phone calls. I try to be really good at emailing people back and calling people back. And if you've ever emailed me and haven't you, I'm sorry, sometimes they get buried in the bottom. But the problem is when that happens, I'm going to do this. I'm going to refer you back to these lines of communication because that problem in particular is something you really need to be talking about with the teacher. Now, I do realize as a school board member, because I've dealt with this, sometimes that happens and you are not going anywhere and you don't feel like you're hurt. And so there are occasions, and I can tell you, in this is my 12th, 11th year of having kids come to Brevard Public Schools. I've only ever had an email of a principal once about a teacher. I think that's pretty good. 
right, Dr. Mullins? I think that's pretty good. Um, so then I had, after I communicated, communicated, you know, with the teacher, it wouldn't get anywhere. Then I went to the principal. And sometimes, even occasionally, that doesn't go so well. And so there are people who are over the principals. And so I just want to refer you to this. I won't read it to you, but there's, there's people, let's say, even just informationally, you've got a child who is, you know, a three-year-old, and you know what, you're already noticing, they're not old enough for school, but you're already noticing some, some issues. You can actually go to um, where it says student services, and it says child find, where it says in parentheses, testing three and four-year-olds. Because you may or may not be aware that we can actually start services as young as age three in the public schools. And they will go through the testing and say, is there something going on? So that extension is there. So you call the district office, 321-633-1000, into that extension. They will get you hooked up with the people. If there, there are other ways that people connect. There's a lot of times, like, my kids went to a certain preschool and they said, hey, we're noticing something with your son. We want to have him tested, so they refer me. But you always have that information at your fingertips. I just wanted to give it to you specifically. This is also on the website somewhere, but the link actually says, I hope we changed it because we talked about changing it. Um, it just says, to whom it may concern. You may not know what that is before, but now you know that's the link where you get this page. Um, I'm so thankful that we got all this information, focus, and the heart screenings and so much good information, mental health, there's so much that's going on in the county. And as the board, you know, all that passes through our, our inbox every day, we've got great work going on. So I wanted to do one more plug and then I can take uh, just a few questions because we only have a few minutes. Um, Nikki Hensley stole, the heart of our bard is so fantastic, but they're stealing our thunder because as board representatives and superintendent, we're trying to also recognize our teachers. So if you also want to send us an email saying, hey, you know what? This counselor, this instructional assistant, this custodian, this cafeteria worker, this bus you know, transportation worker was really awesome. I just want to tell you how awesome they were. We are trying to recognize, we started this last year, recognize our employees with, um, a recognition pins and I usually try to go out to my schools do a little photo op with them and then shout it on Facebook so we can tell the world this is an awesome employee I've seen some of them cry before that's a good way to make people cry because um, of the surprise but this year our theme is impact and we have brand new pens um, we have also excellence achiever and bridge builder and big dreamer I think I got them right um, this is the new one I'm really excited about this so if there's someone who works for BPS who has is is making an impact on the students, on the community, let us know because we want to put it out in hard work. We want to give them a pen. We want to let people know amazing work is going on because amazing work is going on in our schools every day. And uh, we don't have these for volunteers right now, but maybe there will be something new we can start later. So uh, again, if you've got a couple of questions for me, um, I'll take some now, but I also will stick around for about 15 minutes if, if you want to catch me over here um, before I go. Anything? All right, well then I'm gonna hand it back over to awesome Miss Jenny, and thank you guys for being here because we can't do anything that we do without the parent support that we get from all our schools. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate you staying behind if there are any questions. And we also have our focus team staying behind if you have any more questions. And are you wondering who might be able to take that flower? It's the first person who arrived today at your table. The first person. Okay, if you're the only one left, then it's yours. So thank you so much, and we'll see you November the 8th. Or tomorrow at the parody workshop, yes.